You've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the children of Israel. I want to point out that before God gave the Ten Commandments, before he gave, if you look at chapter 20 of Exodus and go on and on and on, these are all the instructions and commandments that God began to give them, chapter after chapter after chapter. But before all of that, before of all those specific or minor or whatever sort of um, instructions. What God really wants from his people is here in verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice. He doesn't say, just go and keep the Sabbath. That's not what God wants. He doesn't say, offer a sacrifice. That's not what God wants. He doesn't say, give 10% of your income, give a tithe to the church. That's not what God wants. And here we see the fundamental difference between truth and religion, having a true relationship with the living God or just being religious. And the difference is this, anybody can perform certain rites or ceremonies or keep certain commandments. The rich young ruler went to Jesus asking, which commandment should I keep so I could inherit eternal life? When they were in the wilderness and Jesus, after he did the miracle of the, the loaves and the fishes, they said, what should we do so that we might have eternal life? They, they want to find what is the thing? What is the button we push? Where's the dotted line we sign? What, what's the right we must keep? We get baptized in water. We do some sort of, we wear a certain hat. We, we, we go a certain place every Thursday. We, we, we do some, that's all religion. And that's not what God has ever wanted. And that's not what God will ever want. The essence of who God is demands only one possible, only one possibility with mankind. If we're going to have interaction with God, then we must, it must be what we see here in verse five. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. But the key here is that we will obey his voice. Do you understand the difference? God is a living God. Living, alive, speaking, acting, moving. And he wants it to be such that we cannot say, we can never reduce our faith to, well, I do this and this and this, and that makes me a Christian. That's never what it is, even though we should do those things. But that's not the point. The point is that I'm subject to the living God who has authority over my life to speak into my life and speak into my heart. And I'm subject and submitted to it. You will find, and I found this over and over throughout the years, that people will come to church and they'll like it and they'll say, so what's the thing I have to do? What's the ritual is what they're asking. How much money is it going to cost? I've literally had people ask, how much does it cost? 
they completely miss the point. They don't understand what we're talking about. No, there's a God. And the choice is this. You keep doing your own thing, living your own way, listening to your own voice, the other voices, the voice of Satan, the voice of your flesh, the voice of the world. Or you subject yourself entirely to God and say, I will follow you. Well, what are the commandments? No, no, no. The commandment is this. Follow God. That's the commandment. Well, what is the thing that I have to do? You can't reduce it to a formula. You can't reduce it to a ritual. You can't reduce it to a rite. You can't reduce it to some act. Why? Because it's an ongoing, perpetual, living relationship with a God who is alive and who speaks. And the moment you cut him off from your life and say, I will not allow him to speak. I will not subject myself to his voice. You've cut yourself off from the living God. And you're on your way, first of all, to discipline. And if you will not repent after after ongoing discipline, then certain judgment and death. You can't say, but I go to church, I paid the money. It's not about going to church and paying the money. But I didn't do this sin. It doesn't matter if you didn't do that sin. You say, I kept all of the Ten Commandments. Number one, I don't believe it. But number two, it doesn't matter if you kept all the Ten, ten Commandments. That's not what the co covenant is. The covenant is not keep the Ten Commandments. The covenant is to hear His voice and obey. You understand that? We're, it's, we're not in a, in a covenant with a, 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 a two tablets of stone. As long as I just keep the things on these two tablets of stone, everything is, is cool. That's not it. It's a relationship with the living God. And if that's not what you have, and that's not what you want, then we are not looking for the same thing. And we don't believe the same thing. And we are not in the same kingdom. Because in the kingdom of God, our God is a consuming fire that speaks. He is a God, and, and to be subject to him means that you subject your life to him on an ongoing basis. And you're looking for his word. You're looking for his voice to guide you, to correct you, to rebuke you, to instruct you, because he does speak and he will speak. And if you're not looking and you close your ears and you harden your heart and you, you become deaf, then you will fall in the desert eventually like Israel and perish like Israel. Why? Well, the covenant he made with them was that they would listen to his voice. But they didn't want that. What did they want? Just show me the ritual. Show me the commandment to keep. Show me how to do the sacrifice. Show me how to do the thing. So I can go about and live my own way. Stiff-necked, deaf-eared, hard-hearted, rebellious generation. And if we are not open to God's voice, that's exactly what we are. What? Stiff-necked. Hard-hearted. And deaf. God have mercy on us that we will never reduce the faith to keeping certain commandments, performing certain acts, or fulfilling certain obligations, that is not what God has required of you. Do you hear what I'm saying? That is not what God has required of you. And if you think that you can get by with that, you're deceived. You cannot. You're deceived. That's never what God asked. Never what God commanded. The command of God when we were converted was never go to church or read the Bible or pray or do those things. Never. That was never the commandment. That was not the covenant God made with anyone when he saved them. Then what was the covenant that we will hear his voice and obey? And that includes everything. Hearing his voice, of course, means we will read the Bible and we do, do all the, those things. But it's not reduced to that because it's a living voice. It's a living voice. He's a living God. And anyone that can reduce him to a package, to a formula, is utterly deceived and has distorted the true meaning of the Scripture. Distorted the Scripture. Distorted the true teaching of 
the, of Christianity. Self-deceived, deceived, and deceiving others. Anyone that believes that and that teaches that is utterly deceived. And one day will wake up to a horrible reality that they did not know God. You cannot reduce God to a formula. You cannot reduce God to a few certain commandments that you must keep. For our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a living God. Our God is the God who speaks. And his covenant for all those that will receive eternal life is that we will hear his voice. That means two things. We will hear it. We will, well, three, we will search for it. We will listen to it. And in the word hear implies we will obey it. We will be subject to it. We will submit to it. Then you will live. If you will not seek his voice, you will not hear his voice. You will not obey his voice. Then you will die. Deuteronomy 8.3. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Where is life? Life is in Jesus Christ in him. How can we be in him? If my word abides in you, then you will abide in me. Did you hear that? My words, my words, my words abide in you, then you will abide in me. There's no life outside of Jesus Christ. So he humbled you allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god life comes through the mouth of god god speaks the living word of god This is the covenant that we will obey, that we will listen and obey to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, that we will not seek for bread alone, but for the true word of God, the voice of God. I prefer to use the word voice because it brings the implication that it's something fresh and new. When you say word, you can just think of all oh, the scriptures written down. It's true. In, that, in one sense, but in another sense, what I'm saying is, no, it's not just a book. It's a living book. It's a living book. I'm not talking about a voice that goes outside of the bounds of Scripture. I'm not talking about weird, necessarily mystical type of experiences that go beyond the bounds of Scripture. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about the fact that God makes his word live and applies it directly it's not just an intellectual thing, but we are saying, God, speak to me that I will, may obey you today. Matthew 4.4. 4. Starting verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Even Jesus, as a man in the flesh, had to live by every word 
that came from the mouth of God. And we know his entire life was led by the living word of God. He didn't have all the instructions from day one. He was led. He went up and prayed all night on a mountain, and God spoke to him, choose these 12. He, he would pray all night on many occasions, and then he would go and say, we must move on from here and go to another place to preach. What, what, what's happening? He's getting his guidance. The word of God is being revealed to him. It's a living word. Even the Son of God was led by the living word of God, he himself being the word, but as a man, led by the revelation of God's voice speaking to him. Jeremiah 7, 21. Thus, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. In other words, fooey on your burnt offerings and sacrifices. I don't want them. Verse 22, for I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. That's not what I commanded your forefathers. That's not the covenant that I made with them. But this is what I commanded them saying. What did, I, what did God command them? What does God command you and I? What does God really have for us today? This is what I commanded them saying, obey my voice. Obey my voice. And I will be your God and you shall be my people. There's no other way anyone can be the people of God outside of this. If we've not come to this, then we are not yet his child. If we have fallen from this, then we are in danger of being cut off. But we must arise to this glorious place of living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God seeking his voice and listening to his voice and obeying his voice. There's, this is a double-edged sword. On one sense, there's a very sobering reality to this that totally cuts us off from the cheapness of artificial religion that just looks for, just show me where to sign, just show me what commandment to keep in this, let me do whatever else I want. That's what Islam is. It's just keep certain commandments, do the fasting, do this and that, and just do whatever else you want. It's just religion. That's what it is. And that's what human nature is looking for. Just keep certain commandments, do certain things, and everything is okay. You don't have to really deal with your flesh. You don't have to really deal with every area of your life. Why? Because God's not going to speak to you. God's not going to guide you. God's not going to correct you. God's not going to rebuke you. God's not going to make you give up anything you don't want to give up. Just keep these certain rules and everything's okay. That is, that is pure flesh. That is the essence of religion. That is not Christianity. That is not the true and living God. That's a dead God, a God who doesn't live, who doesn't exist, who is an idol because, oh, he, oh, just keep these certain things and everything's okay. Everything is good. There's no, there's nothing dynamic about it. There's nothing moving. There's nothing living about it. There's nothing supernatural about it. There's nothing moment by moment about it. But the God of the Bible is alive and he wants to directly guide and work in our lives. And it's the only way that he will, it's the only way he can be worshipped in spirit and in truth, not in Jerusalem or in Samaria or in this mountain or on that mountain. No, no, no. That's not how the living God is worshipped, by a ceremony, by a certain ritual, by a certain location. No, the, the true God can only be worshipped and served in spirit and and in truth. So there's a heaviness to this in one sense that, oh, so I can't look for shortcuts. Because every one of us, in a sense, in one way or another, is always tempted. We want to let our flesh rule our lives. Why? Because it's comfortable. Because it's the easy way. We'd rather let the flesh live. 
We'd rather let our minds just go towards money and go towards comforts and go towards this world. And there's a part of us, there's a temptation within us that wants what the world has to offer. It's a reality. But this, this cuts us off from that completely. And what I mean is that, that, there, that we want to reduce our Christianity to something easy and formulaic so we can go and serve the flesh. That is complete deception. You will not have eternal life if you live that way. You will not have eternal life if you reduce God to an idol. God will not be mocked. God is not mocked. God is not an idol. He's the living God, and he demands to be Lord of our lives. He, do you understand that? He demands to be the Lord, the sovereign God, the sovereign guide or leader and, and guide of our lives, the one who dictates, the one who commands, and the one we obey, the Father, the, the, the Master, the Savior, and the Lord. And if you put him in a box, you put him on the, in church on Sunday and the rest of the week, you go about your own way and think your own thoughts and live your own ways. I, I'm sorry, you're worshiping a false God. You are now falling into the trap of idolatry and God will not have it. God will not have it. You'll be disciplined. And if you don't respond to the discipline, you'll be cut off. How long will he discipline before he cuts off? I don't know, but I wouldn't play games with God. I would not tempt him. So there's the sobriety to it. So we have to, oh, so if we're gonna be Christians, we have to really be Christians. Do you understand? Yes, that's the point. If we're gonna be saved, we have to really be Christians. You can't play this thing. It's not a game. It's not pick and choose. Jesus is all or nothing. He's either Lord of all or not at all. But he's, he's not a slave master either. It doesn't mean that he's going to deprive us of all the good things of life or he's going to deprive us of everything. That's not, not what his intention is. He'll deprive us of a lot of things that we our flesh wants, but then later we're happier. We don't get them anyways. But it means that we lay everything on the altar and we let him decide. And we say, God, I'm not going to be in control of my own destiny. I'm not going to be in control of my own life. I'm going to let you be Lord. So there's one side of this thing where it's like, you can't, you, you can't make a cheap religion. God will not have it. We have to obey the dynamic living voice of the sovereign God. And there's another side to it as well. This is the life of Christianity that we have a living God that's working and speaking and willing to move in our lives on a daily basis, supernaturally. Is that not what we want? Is that not what our hearts long for? God, God in my life, God working in me, God working through me, God revealing himself to me. Paul says, God, he revealed himself to me. He revealed himself in me. And then he revealed himself through me. Is that not what our hearts desire? Is that not the most glorious thing that we could ever have Christ in you, the hope of glory? The excitement. When we read the book of Acts, when we go through, and we're talking about the, the church, and we mentioned on Sunday, like the early church, they were so excited. How could they do stuff like that? Because they experienced this. They were walking with the living God. who was with them moment by moment and working in their hearts and their lives moment by moment and moving in their church supernaturally on a continual basis. And, and there was like, I mean, the living God, they're walking with God. God is with me. God is helping me. God is leading and guiding and correcting and rebuking and comforting. And, and, and there's a, something about it. that causes our spirits to soar. I just want to use an illustration of how a practical aspect of the whole issue of does God still do miracles today or not, for example, or does God still give gifts like tongues and prophecy and healing today, or has he stopped doing those things? Now, 
obviously the Bible never says that God stops giving those gifts. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches anything like that. But, um, but just a very practical issue that I've noticed. When you go down the path that there's no miracles like that, that God does not do such things like that, it kills something inside of you. Something inside of you dies. When you stop believing in the miraculous, when you stop expecting God to do something powerful or something supernatural, something in the human heart, something in our faith kind of dies. Hope kind of dies. When there's a faith and a belief in the supernatural, the potentiality that God can break through at any moment, at any time, and do wonders, and that we're looking for that, that we're expecting that, it does something inside of you. Your spirit will live, will soar. But when that hope and that expectation is somehow taken away, faith is quenched. I don't say it doesn't make you a Christian. I don't say that you're not, a, you're not born again or that you don't, you're not walking with God, but something of faith is quenched. Something of faith is quenched. When I first found out as an early Christian, as a new believer, that there were all these things like miracles and tongues and all this, I mean, my faith just soared. Maybe some of it was naive, naivety, maybe some of it was exaggeration, whatever, but, I, I, but I, I see it as positive. It's good. When you're brought into that realm, there's a reality, there's supernatural things, and we cry out to God, we ask God to give those, we want those, we seek those things. Somehow your faith expands. Somehow your, your joy increases. Somehow your, your, your hope increases. When you take that away, it's like the, cl- the sunshine just got blocked out. <laughs> just like it was sunny, and all of a sudden it's like gray. I mean, you're still alive, but it's like, you know, I prefer a sunny day than a cloudy day. And it's much harder to, to, to stir yourself up with all the peace and the joys. Everyone, it's cloudy, kind of miserable, kind of just the whole mood is different now. Just pull back those layers. The sun comes out. And it's like, hallelujah, glory. It's a beautiful day. Everything is bright. Everything is possible. Have you ever had that feeling? Just, just talking about a mood, not about, I'm not talking spiritual, but just when the sun comes out, it's a beautiful day. You're in a, it cheers your mood somehow. You know what I'm saying? And it's like somehow spiritually speaking, when we remove these restrictions and we look at God through a clearer lens, we wash our eyes, we take off the rose-colored or dark glasses and see, oh, wait a minute, he's much more glorious than I thought. He's not reduced to commandments in a book. He's a living God that moves and works and speaks today. In fact, he commands it to be so. In fact, I have to accept it as so. This is the only way we can really live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You understand that? Because If it was just, oh, I just accept the covenant that I will keep these commandments and that's it, and you're good. Okay, that's not even the covenant God made with Israel. Do you understand that? That's the old covenant, and that's not the covenant he made. He did not make a covenant. Just keep the Ten Commandments and everything will be good. That's not the covenant. I already made it very clear from these scriptures we looked at. The covenant was, you will obey my voice. That includes the Ten Commandments because God spoke those, but it includes far more than that, much, much more than that. You understand? So when we, um, when we bring God out of the box, oh, so you mean God's going to speak to me about more than just certain commandments I, I'm aware of? Or, yeah. In fact, he demands it. <laughs> oh. Let me get ready. Let me prepare my heart. Oh, you, and I have to obey him when he speaks like that as well. Yeah, you have to obey him. It's God. It's God. The Holy Spirit, God speaking, commanding you. He tells you, repent, confess your sin to that person or apologize to that person or, or forgive that person. Give up your bitterness. You, you mean I have to obey that as if it's one of the ten, ten commandments? Of course. And if you don't, you'll perish. What? Yeah, didn't you know if you don't forgive your brother, then God won't forgive you? 
oh yeah, yeah, but I didn't know it. Yeah, but the Holy Spirit revealed it to you. So now it's a commandment and you have to do it. Oh, it's like that. Yeah, that's what it is. God's a living God. Do you know you're not searching for his voice? You're not seeking for him to speak to you? Maybe he wants to, maybe he, but you have closed yourself off. And you say, well, God didn't speak to me. Oh, really? I wonder why. Did you ask? Did you seek? Did you knock? Did you humble yourself? Did you fast? Oh, I, I can't fast. What a lie. I can't fast. I have health issues. Lies. There's so many excuses and lies. You can fast. You can find a way. Just eat bread and water. Just drink bread and just, you can find ways to do it. It's not that you can't, it's you don't want to do it. That's really the reality. I'm speaking from experience. I have all the same excuses as everybody else. You understand? I have all the same excuses. But when we get desperate enough, we have to throw out those excuses. And when we get desperate enough, we will throw them out. And if you haven't got to that point, maybe you're not desperate enough. 